Hi, and welcome everyone to ATI's GEO webinar series. My name is Cindy Martinez, and I'll be moderating today's GeoConnection webinar, Geoscientists in the Media. In today's webinar, we'll be discussing career opportunities for geoscientists in the media, and we'll hear from two geoscientists who are working uh, in film and one geoscientist who is a science journalist. Our webinar today is going to be a multimedia presentation, and it's including some video clips. So the schedule for today, we'll start out with Carolyn Gramling from Earth Magazine, who will be talking about taking the scenic route to a career in science journalism. That will be followed by Doug Prose from the Earth Images Foundation, talking about moving mountains, the joy and challenge of making earth science films. And finally, John Copeland, who actually is from 130 to 145 who will be talking about a producer's perspective on working with geoscientists in the media. And all this will be concluded with a panel discussion with webinar participants. So I'd like to hand it over to Carolyn Gramling now from Earth Magazine. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, so as it says, I am a reporter and the web editor for Earth Magazine, which um, is a publication of the American Geological Institute. and. Uh, this magazine also used to be called GeoTimes, so some of you may be familiar with it as GeoTimes as well. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is basically my journey. I actually um, went all the way through a PhD level um, in marine geochemistry um, and was halfway through my grad program when I decided that I wanted to be a writer. Um, so I just wanted to give you an idea of how I made that transition and talk a little bit about some of that um, background. So first of all, there was my dissertation. Um, that's me standing in front of uh, Woods Hole, standing in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. Um, I was a graduate student in the MIT Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution's Joint Program for Oceanography. This was my uh, dissertation title. <laughs> um, and this actually earned me a PhD in May 2003. But around my senior, my final year, in that program, I had decided that I really didn't want to stay in research. I loved science, loved my field work, but just research was not for me. So I actually discussed this with um, my advisor, who was, a, uh, who was very supportive of the idea that I wanted to try different ways of um, communicating about science. Um, and he helped me sort of devise what my plan B might be. There were two things that I knew when I um, was trying to figure out what it was I wanted to do with my life. <laughs> One was that I wanted very much to stay connected to science, but I knew that research wasn't quite the right fit. Um, and I also knew that I loved writing. Um, so I was only dimly aware at the time that science writing or science journalism was actually a kind of career. Um, and I did a little web research, talked with um, various people um, in my program, uh, my committee members, my advisor, and ultimately um, found out about something called the AAAS Mass Media Fellowship, which was tailor-made for me. Um, so what this is is a program that is run by the American Association for the Advancement of Science, which publishes Science Magazine. Um, and it's designed for PhD or master's students um, who are enrolled in a scientific field. They can apply for this 10-week program to work at some media outlet, um, ranging from television to uh, print to online to radio and um, basically learn about how media produces um, science stories. Uh, the, goals, the stated goals of this Mass Media Fellowship are to enhance coverage of science news, to strengthen bonds between scientists and journalists, um, but it also quite frequently, as in my case, ends up becoming the first step into a different career. Um, so in my um, fellowship, there were 18 of us in my year in 2003. Um, we were all science grad students, mostly had no journalism experience whatsoever. And uh, AAAS gave us basically a weekend orientation session. They taught us a, a few basics of journalism and then sent us off to our outlets around the country. Mine was a, an NPR affiliate station, uh, WOSU AM, which was in Columbus, Ohio. Um, and I spent 10 weeks there. It was a very small station with only three full-time reporters. And so as a result, I got to be on the air quite a lot. That's me in the studio um, editing a story. And uh, since my background was earth science initially, I figured that I would just stick to that. But as it turned out, for a couple of reasons I didn't. One was that I was the only science reporter on staff, and they didn't 
um, have anybody else to cover any of the other science stories, and so they just assumed that since I was a scientist with a capital S, I would know everything about science whatsoever. Um, so from astrophysics to biomedical research, that's what they wanted me to cover. Um, so they just sent me out on all sorts of stories. So initially, I also found that covering stories in my own field of earth science were, was a little bit difficult. It was difficult to sort of not be overly detailed in my stories. So these are some of the early stories I did. I, I did about 19 stories in the 10 weeks that I was there, which was quite a lot. Um, and I ended up covering all kinds of topics, um, including you know, various technology topics. Um, one of my favorite stories was a bioethics of Frankenstein story <laughs> um, about such topics as organ donation and you know, where life ends, how you know when someone is actually um, deceased. Um, I did a story on the food web of Lake Erie and um, invasive species, and then mammal diversity and climate change. So I'm just going to play for you just a little clip of one of these, just to give you an idea. This is actually a promo that I did for the bioethics of Frankenstein's story, which was going to appear on our local morning edition. Nearly 200 years ago, Mary Shelley had a nightmare, and a Halloween legend was born. Her novel, Frankenstein, raises issues that scientists and philosophers still wrestle with. How do you define when people are dead? It's very difficult. I wish that it were so simple. I wish that we could just plug in patients into the power grid. <laughs> Monday on Morning Edition, we'll have a report on Frankenstein, cloning, and the meaning of life on NPR 820 WOSUAM, Columbus Public Radio. So that was uh, um, one of the stories that I did. Um, and I, like I said, I did about 19 total stories, and they were across the board. And here are three more clips um, from stories that I did while I was at WSU. Uh, the first is on invasive species into the Great Lakes. Um, I also did a story on um, smart dust technology, um, researchers at Ohio State University using that, and also on mammal diversity and climate change. Um, and this just indicate some of the range of stories that I was able to do while I was at the radio station. Zebra mussels were one of those species that hitched a ride in the ballast of a ship. They first appeared in the lakes in the mid-1980s. Zebras and their cousins, the quagga mussels, compete for food needed by aquatic animals native to the lakes. Researchers say now these mussels are part of another problem. They're changing the food web. The food web is made up of organisms that feed on each other. Usually it's a chain of small, even microscopic species that are food for ever larger species. Zebra mussels are near the bottom. For their food, they filter large volumes of water containing contaminant-laden algae and sediment. In the process, they ingest PCBs and other toxins. Gene Kim is a researcher in the Ohio State University's Aquatic Ecology Laboratory. He says that zebra mussels and a non-native fish called the round goby have helped to form a new food chain within Lake Erie, a chain that can connect harmful chemicals buried in lake mud to humans. A lot of the uh, exotic species, these alien species, have incorporated themselves into the Lake Erie food web. And there's a lot of ramifications in terms of will they change the cycling of historical contaminants that right now are are in the sediments, but they could be redirected back into sport fish and uh, eventually humans. Zebra mussels have few natural predators in North America, and they reproduce rapidly. As a result, they've been wiping out native mussels and clogging up water intake pipes in the lake. So the arrival of the round goby, which likes to eat zebra mussels, would seem to be good news. Instead, it has proven to be a double-edged sword. Roy Stein is a professor in Ohio State's Aquatic Ecology Laboratory. He says the PCBs and other contaminants, once held captive in the sediment at the bottom of Lake Erie, are taken up by zebra mussels, and then the zebras are eaten by the round goby. And then, interestingly enough, round gobies are important prey for smallmouth bass that people eat, and all of a sudden we have the opportunity for those PCBs that were stored in the sediments to come up through the food chain and influence humans. So, Stein says, those contaminants that were trapped in the sediment now have a pathway up the food chain. Gene Kim's research is confirming the link between smallmouth bass and round gobies. He says it's clear that round gobies like to eat zebra mussels, but it's less clear whether bass prefer to eat gobies over other prey fish. 
So Kim devised a laboratory behavior study that let the smallmouth bass choose between several types of prey, including gobies, emerald shiners, and crayfish. The interesting thing is that they actually target uh, these emerald shiners more often than round gobies. But emerald shiners have superior escape abilities. Round gobies, Kim says, just don't swim away as fast, and so get eaten the most. He adds that when compared with the stomach contents of Lake Erie bass, this laboratory result is borne out. More gobies were consumed than any other prey. Roy Stein says that this puts the system in a kind of double jeopardy. The combination of PCBs plus being a, a slow prey uh, causes uh, perhaps more PCBs to move up through the food web than otherwise might be the case. PCBs have been linked to cancer and birth defects in humans, and they're not the only contaminants in the lake. Other research indicates this new food chain might be helping other pollutants in the sediment find their way to humans. For example, another Ohio State study finds methylmercury is also getting into the food web through invasive species. Methylmercury in fish can cause neurological problems for expectant mothers and other health problems. Doug Hafner is the Canada Research Chair for Great Lakes Environmental Health and a professor of biological sciences at the University of Windsor. He agrees a zebra mussel, round goby, smallmouth bass food chain has created a route that exposes humans to harmful chemicals in lake sediment. For a chemical to be of concern to us, it has to be biologically available. It has to be able to enter a human being or a fish or, or whatever it might be. Some chemicals may be out there but not available. We can measure them, but they're not really a risk to the, um, to the ecosystem per se. But processes can change, which make them available. Martin Berg is a professor of aquatic ecology at Loyola University, Chicago. He says the non-native species have had a similar impact on PCB transfer from Lake Michigan sediment. You can think of it almost like a conduit, like a pipe. Now we have a direct link as you move up the food web to organisms that are going to be directly consumed by humans. And the problem spreads as the non-native species expand their range. Researcher Gene Kim says that the implications are far-reaching. Not only are we just talking about a Great Lakes phenomenon, zebra mussels have already escaped into the Mississippi drainage, and right, right now, round gobies, um, we're spending a lot of money to prevent round gobies from entering that same drainage. Scientists' concerns about toxins in the lakes are not limited to how invasive species are changing the food web. Researchers say that other changes caused by people can help harmful chemicals trapped in sediments to return to the ecosystem. Ultimately, they say, each of these issues is part of a much larger concern, the overall health of the environment. A car rolls slowly between two lines of orange flags scattered across the lawn of the Chemical Abstract Service Building just north of Ohio State. The crowd of engineers and journalists gathered to watch then turns from the live display on the lawn towards a large screen set up in the shade of a tree, where a cartoon image of a car has appeared between two lines of red points. Each of these points, or motes, represents a small wireless sensor integrated with a smart dust device. The array of these sensors is designed not only to detect movement, but also to distinguish between the movement of metallic objects, such as vehicles and people carrying weapons, and non-metallic objects, such as civilians without weapons. Ohio State University Professor of Computer and Information Science, Anish Arora. The concept that we are focusing on is called the line in the sand. And the idea is that one can deploy a large collection of sensor actuator computers in a remote area. And as objects go through this network, the network itself can distinguish different types of objects and try and classify them. The OSU team, led by Professor Aurora, is part of a consortium of universities developing large-scale applications for smart dust, a playful name for an innovative technology that uses tiny, inexpensive sensors that relay information to a central computer. The potential applications for smart dust technology are numerous. Researchers have suggested that it can be used to monitor changes in light, temperature, and humidity, to track pollutants, pesticides, and gas leaks, and to detect nerve agents and other biological weapons. The University Consortium, funded by the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, is focused on developing large-scale applications for this technology, one of which is how to overcome limitations of size, detection, and network communication on the battlefield. Professor Aurora. The idea that you could actually classify intruders based on one mode doing some kind of complex signal processing is infeasible. So in fact what we would like to focus on is to look at large-scale services. What happens when you take a hundred, a thousand, ten thousand, one million of these of these modes? 
can you get them to collaborate to, uh, to solve the problem? While other universities focus on shrinking hardware and developing software, the OSU group is trying to test the limits of networking and communication among the sensors. Aurora's team uses a network of moats on the chemical abstracts lawn to demonstrate how the sensors can detect two separate intruders with guns, played by graduate students carrying metal pipes. Aurora notes that determining that an object is a car rather than a soldier with a gun requires the combined efforts of more moats. A car affects about 9 to 25 moats at the same time. So whenever 9 to 25 modes collaborate on their decision, they can take the decision of a car in this case. Similarly, you can go to a truck or a tank and scale up accordingly. Prabal Dutta, a graduate student in OSU's Department of Electrical Engineering and a member of Aurora's team, says that the moats become a cooperative network, able to detect and track objects moving among them. The sensors all talk with themselves in kind of a dense mesh um, so they talk with their neighbors, kind of decide amongst themselves what they're seeing and then they'll basically export their messages out. At that point, Dutta says, a computer a few hundred feet away, or even a satellite link halfway around the world, can detect the different types of targets from people to soldiers to cars. The OSU group also performs a demonstration of how the sensors can synchronize their time when devices in the network fail or are unable to talk to each other. To maintain a common sense of time among the network moats, a sensor can be moved from one region of moats to another, bringing time with it. Aurora calls these sensors in charge of synchronization mobile moats. Here we have a network where the nodes cannot talk to each other, but they're actually marching to the common ground. Aurora adds that the next step is to give the moats some sense of localization, to know where they are without being told. Telling each sensor where it is could become prohibitively difficult as the number of moats in an array reaches thousands or tens of thousands. The goal of this technology is you drop them on the ground and they figure out their own location. At the moment, that technology piece is missing. So we have told them, here is the location you're at. And so now, based on that localization information, the network is formed. Carolyn Gramling, WOSU News. Less than a century from now, visitors to Great Smoky Mountains National Park, one of the largest protected areas in the eastern United States, may find that the scenery has changed a bit. In a study published this week in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, researchers at Yale University's School of Forestry and Environmental Studies have found that if current trends in climate change continue, some species of mammals presently inhabiting U.S. parks could migrate from these protected areas as their habitats alter. This would complicate conservation and protection efforts for the most vulnerable species. Oswald Schmitz is a professor of population and community ecology at Yale and a co-author of the study. Parks and protected areas are an important way of protecting biodiversity, and a lot of times their, their primary mission is in that capacity. Schmitz and his co-authors modeled the effects of increasing atmospheric carbon dioxide levels on the ecosystems of eight national parks. Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has increased by about 30 percent since the Industrial Revolution of the late 1800s, and is projected to be double pre-industrial revolution levels by the start of the next century. Schmitz notes that conservation problems can arise when changing habitats combine with predetermined park boundaries. Parks are fixed political entities, and there's no flexibility to move. It's, it's impossible to move the boundaries of Yellowstone, or it might be quite difficult to move the boundaries of Yellowstone northward. So we were then asking, well, if species are going to reshuffle, what's going to happen to these parks that are supposed to be protecting the, the current uh, kinds of species and the habitats that are contained in them? Vegetation in the southernmost parks included in the study, Great Smoky Mountains National Park along the North Carolina-Tennessee border and Big Bend National Park in southwestern Texas, were found to be the most vulnerable to climate change. Consequently, these parks were predicted to suffer the greatest loss of mammalian diversity. One reason for their greater vulnerability is that these two parks each contain a single ecosystem type. The Great Smoky Mountains, for example, is currently temperate deciduous forest, but is forecasted to become warm temperate mixed forest. Big Bend, currently subtropical arid shrubland, will become grassland. Other parks, such as Yellowstone, that contain multiple ecosystems within their boundaries, are less likely to suffer species loss. Predicted species losses from Yellowstone were, in fact, zero. The study notes that the parks won't empty of mammals. For one thing, Schmitz explains, not all mammals are at equal risk. While smaller mammals, such as some rodent and bat species, are more likely to be lost from the parks altogether, larger species, such as elk, deer, and wolves, are more able to shift their ranges. Furthermore, while some species may leave the parks, others may migrate in. However, as Schmitz notes, these new species may further complicate conservation efforts as a result of changing species interactions. We 
predict a lot of immigration, not extinction, but a lot of new species flowing in as, as they migrate northward or expand their geographic ranges northward. And so what you end up having is new predators coming into areas where certain prey species might not have experienced them for hundreds or maybe thousands of years. Ultimately, the study suggests that the long-term indirect results of such species reshuffling are unpredictable, which will make it difficult for national parks to protect species in their habitats. Schmitz hopes that this study will help to make the effects of climate warming seem more concrete. People in the United States have mixed responses to the issue, and hopefully this kind of information might make it a little more tangible to them about you know, what kind of future they might be inheriting or actually passing on to their children and grandchildren. Carolyn Gramling, WOSU News. So once those 10 weeks were over, though, I didn't really have another plan for what I was going to do next. Um, and I think this is something that you know, a lot of people were sort of wrestling with in my fellowship. They were scientists. They, many of them went back like I did and finished their degrees, but then the question is how do you continue with that transition into science journalism when you have no clips yet? Um, I had a bunch of radio clips, but no real print clips. So um, the real solution for that, you can do a number of things. Some people went into science journalism programs, which I'll talk about um, a little bit later, um, actual degree programs in science journalism. There are a number of them around the country. Other people did internships, and that was the route that I chose to take. Um, I ended up doing two actual internships. Oops. I guess this one has three on there. Well, so the University of Florida News Office was not, in fact, an internship that was actually a temporary variety position, but um, I worked there for about nine months, and they gave me um, a lot of background in uh, writing in AP style and that kind of thing, so it was actually very useful. And from there, I went to Science Magazine, uh, where I worked for six months, um, and from there I did a third internship, which was at Science News Magazine, um, that lasted for about four months. So by the end of that time, I had about a little over a year and a half of um, uh, actual time as a science journalist, but more importantly, I had a lot of clips, and that's the main thing that people need in order to really get farther into the field. Um, so from there, I applied for a job at Geotimes, um, which is now Earth Magazine. Um, I had spent uh, most of my time as, a, as an intern writing about all kinds of different topics. So again, still not really earth science focused. Um, but I, I missed writing about you know, what I most cared about, which was geology and oceanography and those kinds of issues. So I applied for a job at, earth, at Geotimes and um, got the job. And I have been here now for about four years um, as a reporter. Um, and I've covered a wide range of topics. Um, so these are some of the stories. All of these are cover stories that I wrote. So I covered algae biofuels, um, super earths, and volcanic ash, and um, ocean sprawl issues. This is more of a policy story, so just still a, a broad range, but within my, my home field. Um, in addition, I am also, um, for the last year and a half, I've been the um, web editor, which also includes um, doing social media for um, Earth Magazine. Uh, so. I control, I um, edit the content for the website for Earth. Um, I'm also responsible for producing um, multimedia, such as audio slideshows. We have this rebuilding Afghanistan story, um, which is up on the website right now. Um, so if you want to see this video, I'm going to show this to you. Uh, um, this is not a story that I originally wrote for the magazine, but I did convert it into this audio slideshow, and this is sort of a way of being able to um, provide content for people in, in different media. Um, it's a little bit more of a digestible form. It's, we have um, one print audience. We, we have people who come solely to the website as well, so this is a way of giving them that content as well. Um, and this, kind of, this story in particular was about um, uh, how the U.S. Geological Survey has been working with Afghan scientists to um, develop the country's resources and over what's been happening over the last few decades there and where, where that situation is today. Ravaged by war, drought, and natural hazards such as earthquakes and landslides, Afghanistan's people face many challenges. 
But the country also has untapped resources, great natural beauty, deep supplies of groundwater, and a vast mineral wealth, including coal, gems like emeralds, and metals like copper and iron. For nearly 40 years, spanning the Cold War, Afghanistan's own civil war, and the U.S.-led invasion of the country in 2001, U.S. Geological Survey scientists have worked with Afghan scientists to map and develop the country's resources. Two stories in the most recent issue of Earth Magazine highlight the daunting challenges these scientists dealt with in the past and continue to face. Geologist Jack Schroeder began his career in Afghanistan in 1972, amassing satellite images and maps of the country. He worked with the radio program Voice of America to broadcast explanations to the Afghan people about their country's frequent devastating earthquakes, as well as about Soviet exploitation of Afghan mineral resources. Schroeder is now working with the U.S. military, teaching soldiers headed to Afghanistan about the country's geology, natural hazards, environmental issues, and water resources. Afghanistan is also suffering under a decade-long drought, and ongoing war and shrinking glaciers make the situation even more dire. The country has water resources, groundwater fed by snowmelt and rainfall in the mountains, but lacks the technology and security to access them. Now, USGS scientists and the U.S. military are working with local scientists and engineers to adapt a thousands-year-old Afghan technology to access this deep water and, hopefully, to help bring peace. In the latest issue of Earth, Jack Schroeder tells his unique story, a first-person account of how he, the USGS, and Afghanistan have been entwined over the last few decades. And writer David B. Williams describes the struggle to find clean water in this landlocked, water-starved country. Read more about efforts to rebuild Afghanistan in the July Earth on Newsstands Now. For Earth Magazine, I'm Carolyn Gramling. In addition to those um, various multimedia things, I also am responsible for a lot of our social media content. So I just put up here the links to our Facebook and our Twitter pages. Um, and if you want to, after the webinar later on, want to take a look and see what kinds of stuff um, we do there. Okay, so um, let's say that you are a scientist and you want to become a science journalist. Uh, what are some of the main questions that you might have? Uh, number one would be, do you need a degree in journalism or in science journalism to go this route? The answer is not necessarily. I don't have one. Um, I do think that you need, the, main, the most important thing that you need are clips. You need to have something to show people when you're applying for internships as well as for jobs. Um, so how can you go about doing that when you get started? Um, so to get started, first thing I would recommend is going out and buying the latest issue of Writer's Market, which you can find at your local bookstore. Um, so find the 2010 issue, and in that, in Writer's Market, it will actually tell you all the different places that take freelance writing. Um, you need to get clips. So uh, the first thing that you want to do is find the kinds of places you might want to write within your own field, um, or focus on magazines or publications that are focused on your field. Um, you can pitch stories. You may need to write for free at first, but the important thing is to build a portfolio. If you're still a student, you can also apply for internships. Um, and also, um, there are, of course, if you want to go this route, there are also science journalism or journalism programs scattered around the country. Um, some of the major ones are University of California, Santa Cruz, um, Boston University, MIT has one, um, of course, Columbia has journalism school. Um, so there's a number of different ones. There's a Johns Hopkins science writing program. Um, but you, all of these are you know, potential ways to um, hone your skills as well. Okay, and uh, I will take questions like everyone else at the end of the presentation. Thanks so much. Thanks, Carolyn. So if you have questions for Carolyn, be sure to type them into the question box and save them for the end of the, the session. At this time, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Doug Prose from the Earth Images Foundation. Doug will be sent, handing the keyboard over to you now. Good morning, everybody. I'm in uh, Oakland, Carrick, about a mile from the uh, Hayward Fault. So I'm looking out my window now at the Hayward Fault and it's not rumbling, so I'm happy. So uh, we haven't had an earthquake once, and, uh, but we usually get one every couple months. So that's my geologic setting here for you. And um, 
I guess what I'll do is uh, do a similar thing as what uh, Carolyn did is is do a um, kind of a pathway of how I got into being into the media uh, and starting off as a geologist because I did a similar thing, uh, a similar sort of pathway, and there's a couple of similarities uh, between the way she went her way and I went my way, so it's kind of interesting. Um, so I'll I'll kind of start back uh, in my first year of college is when I actually got interested in uh, geology, and um, I really didn't know what I wanted to do at that time. I was interested in a lot of things when I went to college. I was just taking a lot of different classes, and uh, I really wasn't even thinking too much about uh, what I um, was going to do with my life after college. So, um, but I knew that eventually what I wanted to do was work outside and uh, have a have a career where I was outside a lot and climbing around uh, preferably in mountains and hiking because I really liked doing that. And I was also interested in science and environmental issues too. So um, eventually I, I uh, what I wasn't interested in at the time was television or, or film production which is what I'm doing now. So that was kind of interesting. In fact, I never even uh, gave it a thought uh, that, that that was kind of a career path uh, in, in my mind anyway. So um, I took a class in environmental geology uh, and, and from that class I was totally sold on geology. And uh, the, it seemed to combine my interests in the environment, geology, and just sort of how people relate with the earth. That just, it seemed very relevant to me. So um, I ended up at uh, University of California, Santa Cruz, and I got a double major in earth sciences and environmental studies. So um, right after that, I went to work at the US Geological Survey as a geologist. And uh, that was a really fascinating and, and fantastic experience. Uh, they pretty much, um, they, it, when you're new at that at the USGS, you can do a lot of different things. They encourage you, or they did at this, that time, to get in, involved in a lot of things. So you go out with a lot of different people in the field. You do mapping. I did geomorphology. Uh, I wrote and edited reports and articles. Um, did a lot of field work in the Mojave Desert, uh, which was fantastic in California. And, and we camped most of the time. So. Um, that was really nice to be outside working almost, uh, you know, for, for weeks at a time, camping out in the desert. So um, I had also had a, a side interest, which was uh, playing music. Um, I was actually playing in, in rock and roll bands at night when I was back in the San Francisco Bay Area and uh, playing uh, in clubs. And those days there were a lot of clubs where you could play. And... Um, I say those days as if I'm ancient or something, but anyway, um, you, uh, I got to also do a lot of recording in studios and uh, work in studios. I, I recorded on an album. I actually made my own album, and I made a couple of videos and edited a few videos, and two of them ended up on MTV, which was really neat. And um, so I learned how to edit and work with sound and soundtracks and just work with studios and knobs and all that stuff, and I loved that. I just loved that, which didn't really fit in with with a love of being outside and outdoors, but what can I say? <laughs> so um, eventually somebody at the USGS asked me just to help help them produce a, a video. I can't hardly remember the topic now, but she knew that I did a little editing and things, and I might know how to do it, and I said, yes, sure. and. When I did that, it, it, I, it finally dawned on me, well, this is a really neat way to combine all of my interests, which were doing geology, being, you know, communicating geology in kind of a simple way to people, um, editing, recording, and writing. So um, I decided that this was the way to go. And, uh, but I didn't really have any uh, training in filmmaking or or the, the, you know, the journalism skills that you really need to produce good films. So I, there, um, fortunately, uh, and especially now, there's a lot more uh, possibilities, but I took uh, some um, workshops at filmmaking institutes. And here in San Francisco, they have the Bay Area Video Coalition. They had 
Film Arts Foundation. Um, a lot of cities um, everywhere now uh, around the world have places where you can go and just sort of take maybe a two-day workshop on how to field production or you know one a two-day or, or three-day workshop on editing or, or storytelling. Um, there's workshops on fundraising, which are absolutely essential to know about also. So um, I took all those and uh, just sort of built up my skills until the Loma Prieta earthquake happened, and this is 1989. So um, I basically uh, let this, I, I, the survey let me just go out and film and for two months actually, do nothing but just go out and document all the, uh, everything I, I, you know, I could think of in terms of, of earthquake damage, and, and, and I sort of did it in a geologic perspective. So um, that kind of made what I was doing unique from what the news was doing, and it en ended up that a lot of producers found out about what I was doing, and they came to me for footage because I had all the big cracks in the road and geologists uh, working and looking at these things. So um, right away, I got to know a lot of the producers from the BBC, from NOVA, uh, just people were coming from all around the world, Japan. Um, uh, so I got to go out with them also and, and work with them and, and ended up sharing footage with them, um, just basically having a, a good hands-on experience. Excuse me. Turn this on here. For, um, for actually working in, in, in a real life situation, making films, geology films. So that was a huge, tremendous help for me. And um, it, it, to, to make a long story short, I, I, I just started making films full time at the USGS and started making PBS programs. And uh, they did really well. And eventually I decided to go out and just go out on my own and I formed my own company. It's actually a nonprofit organization and this was about 15 years ago now. So um, I've been doing full-time films ever since and I'm definitely probably the luckiest person on the planet as far as I'm concerned. So um, that's, uh, I, I use my geology every day uh, in what I do. Um, in fact, um, I, I've learned incredible amounts of geology. I, I, I was pretty much, when I was at the survey, I focused on geomorphology, but by doing films about geology, I've learned about seismology, structural geology, hydrology, geochemistry, a huge range of geology that I probably would not have, have gotten, or at least not as quick as I have, um, if I had stayed in my field as a geologist. Um, but that's not to say that if I was just doing geology now only, I think I'd still be totally happy because I totally love geology and, and um, a lot of times I work with geologists in the field and, and I kind of kind of contrast my life with their life in my mind and I realize, gosh, they, they travel around, they, they climb around the mountains as much as I do. They, they, instead of making films, they give presentations with slides and things, but it's they're sort of, you know, and it's, they're, in fact, it's a little harder for them because they have to, um, to give their talks to uh, colleagues, which is a little more of a competitive situation, whereas I can make my TV shows and they go out there in the world and I, uh, you know, uh, people aren't, you know, firing questions back at me <laughs> immediately about whether they think what I'm saying is right or wrong. So <laughs> it's a little easy in that, easier in that sense. Uh, so anyway, um, I think if I was a geologist now, I would probably just carry my film camera around with all the time and, and document everything with the camera in addition to making maps and taking notes and things. So it would probably all work out. So um, let's see, let me go to my slide here. And uh, I guess the question is, do um, geeking mix? Um, and I say that uh, they very absolutely, definitely do. And, uh, but the big question is, that's great, but does the public really want to see or do they really care about geology? And um, this, uh, you know, is, is, I realize this is a great life. This is really fun making these shows. Um, when I went to um, 
ask for money to make TV shows. It, it costs a lot of money to make the TV show. So um, I had to uh, find myself explaining in great detail that, you know, why this TV show was going to be uh, interesting to the general public. So um, I actually had to, uh, let's see, where are my notes here? I actually, in, in grant writing, um, actually had to uh, write uh, big descriptions of why I thought that uh, geology films were going to be something that the public cared about. So finally, we needed some quantitative data, and we did a study, uh, a national survey. We commissioned a survey by an independent group a few years ago, and we asked typical TV viewers, do you like to watch science? So we started off with simple, you know, do you like to watch science shows? And uh, it turned out that half the people in the survey um, watched a science show or history show at least two or three times a week. So that was kind of interesting. That was surprising to us that they watched them that much. Uh, it's just a little less than your typical um, sitcoms or or dramas, dramatic shows. So there was there was a big audience of people out there that liked to watch science shows, and they also um, gave an interest rating of about 4.2, 4.3 out of five for the science shows that they have watched. So they're not only watching them; they really enjoy them. And um, almost, you know, 90% of the respondents said they wanted to see more. And um, that's an important point because there aren't that many uh, geology shows uh, that are made. So um, there's kind of a big, there's a big opportunity to, uh, to make a lot more geology shows. So, um, and then uh, we asked, um, let's see, where are my notes here? We asked uh, people... Um, this is uh, television audiences and high school teachers. Uh, we, we asked high school teachers what their perceptions were, what the kids would think. We asked them, which kind of science shows do you like best? And so we had a list. We had engineering shows, wildlife shows, which, you know, wildlife, biology, geology, chemistry, and physics. Well, we were pretty surprised that the television audience was actually most interested in, in geology. So that was really, really cool to, to see that. And we were really pleased by that. that okay, so it, you know, if you get a geology show produced, it's going to have an eager audience on the other side. So, um, and it, it was surprising that it, it beat out wildlife shows. So that was great. And then um, we asked the same thing of the, of the high school kids, and geology won there too. And we even threw in uh, archaeology and engineering, art history, and math for the kids. So, um, it, it's, so geology was it. They want to see geology shows. So uh, it's, it's, if you do get into a path where you produce a, you know, TV shows, you will have a willing audience out there. So that's really gratifying to know that. And um, okay, so let's see. I think I'm going to go into a, um, is, I think what, what I can do as far as if you do want to go that pathway, uh, like Caroline was saying, um, you don't necessarily have to have a, a journalism degree. In fact, uh, the BBC, uh, they used to have a policy of hiring uh, when they hired producers to do their science programs. Half the, they had a policy of hiring half people from a science background and the other half from journalism. So um, they actually intentionally wanted to not have everybody have a journalism background. And so they kind of threw everybody together at that point and they all learned from each other um, how to sort out how to make the best stories. So. That's interesting. So if you're in science, it's okay. <laughs> there is a pathway into the media world, but it's, it's, it's not real clear how to do it. And it seems like everyone I talk to has a different path. Um, there's no official sort of path to do it. But um, with, like Carolyn was saying, you have to have clips. Um, it's sort of the same way with uh, television. Uh, the only uh, the, the challenge there is to actually make a clip because... Um, it, 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 caught, it 
it either costs money or it takes a lot of time. So you either have to have money or a lot of time. And usually when you're at the uh, student stage, you don't have a lot of money. So you just got to uh, figure out, you just got to realize you're going to have to make your clip without <laughs> any money. And uh, the, great, the great thing about that is uh, like little, even little HD cameras now are very inexpensive and um, you can edit things in very high quality on a, on a computer now. And, and when I was first starting, that was just simply not the case. It, it, was, it cost a lot of money just to go in and, and just to edit at the lowest quality. You had to rent the equipment to do it, and it was roomfuls of equipment too. So it's, it's much easier in that sense to um, make your own films, which is great. So um, the other thing that I would say is uh, do an internship try to work with somebody uh, on it on one film it, especially um, kind of in this I think really the one of the most important things to do is learn how to tell a story so um, it, even if you can just sort of sit with uh, people who are producing a, a TV show and talk about how they're envisioning telling the story that is extremely important because you can make something look pretty good and really nice and edit it and put a lot of cool effects and everything but if the story isn't strong if people just won't watch it they'll get bored and turn it off pretty soon so the story learning how to, how to tell a story is, is very important and you can just you can do that by reading um, articles uh, or you could watch TV shows or you know read books but because there, there are special ways of telling stories that there's kind of like four or five different ways you can tell a, a good science story type thing. So you can learn to do that by just, you know, reading and watching things. And uh, I also think um, the other thing to do is, uh, is stay in the field, kind of stay in geology. I actually still give talks just about geology. And um, I go to conferences and keep my contacts up. and uh, I, I really enjoy that uh, for one thing, but also it's important because if you get a, a film subject sometime in the future that you may not know things about, it's great to know who to go to to, uh, to get some information about that subject. So, okay, I think that's probably about it, but there is a clip that I have, just, just if you want to watch for a minute of a pretty neat show we made a couple of years back about the ninth highest mountain on Earth, which is Nanga Parbat, and that's in the Himalayas, and it's also the fastest growing mountain on Earth. So um, if we want to watch that clip, we can do that. This is Pashal in northern Pakistan, a day's journey from the great Himalaya range. It was here in Peshawar, 30 years ago, that a long-time geological mystery unexpectedly surfaced. It all began at the University of Peshawar, where a geology student named Kasim Jan was pondering his future. He sought out his professor for advice. He took me to this map, showed me, pointed out to this blank area and said here is a big chunk of Pakistan territory in the northwest Himalaya which has not been previously mapped. Go there, you can work for all your life there until you die. What Kazim Jan didn't know was that his quest would lead him to a mountain unlike any other mountain on earth a mountain that would shed new light on that great unsolved geological mystery. What makes a mountain grow? Kazim John's journey took him along the Karakoram Highway. For thousands of years, travelers from India and neighboring countries had converged on this part of Pakistan on their journey northward. 
The Karakoram Highway was the only road that would lead Kasim into the Great Himalaya Range. It was slow going on this narrow highway, heavily plied by trucks bound for China. Heading north, the land quickly became steeper and more unstable. Entire villages were perched atop freshly gouged landslides, ready to spill into the river far below. The road itself was extremely precarious. It clung to a cliff above the steep gorge of one of the Earth's most important rivers, the mighty Indus. This river once supported one of the great cultures of the ancient world, the Indus Valley Civilization. Today, the Indus continues to bring life-giving water to all of Pakistan. When Kazim John reached the blank spot on his geologic map, everything changed. This was Kohistan, and it was a most formidable place. In spite of the torrents of water crashing through the landscape, Kazim thought of it as a mountain desert. He immediately noticed that the rocks of Kohistan were completely unlike anything he had seen on his journey. And sticking up above Kohistan was an enormous and very strange mountain. People called it Nanga Parbat, Kashmiri words for naked mountain. Okay, I think that's probably enough for now. Let's, I could probably stop it there. All right. Well, thank you, Doug. I, I think okay. you're a pretty lucky guy as well. Your career sounds pretty amazing. Yeah. <laughs> now I'd like to turn it over to John Copeland. So if you have questions for Doug or for Carolyn and for John coming up, don't forget you can type those at any time into the question box. Hi there. So um, my career path was a little different than both Doug and Carolyn's. Um, I've always been a filmmaker. Uh, that's what I uh, studied in college, and uh, I've been doing this for, oh, God, it surprises me how long it is. It's 36 years. Uh, and I've actually had the uh, opportunity to work on a wide variety of shows. I started out in feature films and kind of migrated over to television. I've done a lot of drama, and in the last 10 years, uh, I, is when I really got into doing science documentaries. Uh, I was uh, Pierre de Lesbenois, who is uh, here at Evergreen Films with me. We did a lot of the big uh, specials for the Discovery Channel. Uh, Dinosaurs from America, the Dinosaur Planet, to name a couple. But back in, uh, oh, about three years ago, four years ago, we had the opportunity to collaborate on a fairly large uh, show on earth science with uh, AGI and Discovery. And one of the things that has been um, really fun in doing these kinds of, this kind of programming is what, for me personally, is what I get to learn in the course of making a show. It's uh, somewhat like going uh, and, you know, taking, getting a getting, uh, you know, graduate seminars in, uh, in subjects, the, which is quite, you know, quite wonderful. I've got to uh, collaborate with over, um, okay, during the course of uh, working on Faces of Earth, uh, I was able to uh, actually collaborate with about 60 Earth scientists around the planet. And one of the really important things in doing a science show is getting the information correct, and as well as telling a story. Uh, Doug is very right that story is what either makes stuff work or not work, uh, and will keep an audience engaged or not engaged. 
which is uh, what it's all about. And we don't want uh, the audience turning, you know, picking up the remote and turning the channel. Uh, we'll look at. I've got four short clips, all um, examples of different parts of Earth processes that we worked with scientists on uh, on developing and also they had a lot of input as we created the uh, the animation here for uh, uh, the accuracy uh, the first clip which is clip one is uh, and it's not a very long clip it's about 10 seconds or so well, actually it's longer than that but if you play that it is this, the life of a water molecule from falling down you know from the sky either becoming ice or melting into the sea being subducted down deep into the surface where it eventually gets recycled and I think this is one of the things that is uh, very fun to convey to viewers that you know earth science and geology shows are not just about the big things that we experience every day like this morning out here in California in Pacoima we had a 4.4 earthquake well those get everybody's attention um, so do volcanic eruptions uh, those are the things that happen that briefly intersect our lives make everybody kind of wake up and pay attention but there's more going on on this planet than just that and this is what is was part of the illustration of this clip was that uh, earth is constantly moving it's constantly changing and it is always recycling everything that we see on this planet is made out of the compounds and the chemicals that you know were in the rocks that all slam together that form the dirt ball that we live on um, and these are really cool things to, to I mean, for me personally again to you know to learn from the scientists now one of the challenges that I faced in in making these kinds of first science shows and if you are interested in following a job into the media um, it is not only telling a story it's telling a story in a concise and interesting way and over the years one of what I have seen of our science community's um, shortcomings is the inability for people to convey a story that grabs the people that are watching, the average, everyday, run-of-the-mill folks out on the street, that they can understand. It's not in some academic speak or it's not a subject that goes too deep and becomes very complex very uh, very quickly it's being able to tell these stories and to illustrate events out of geology that you you can quickly grasp and understand uh, this is the cross-section of a cascade style volcano uh, that we created a, a cross-section of to show really how a volcano works. There's been kind of many of these done in the past, but we are learning new things all the time about how our Earth works. Um, this is visually done in such a way that you can quickly grab it and understand it. Uh, you kind of see where where stuff is coming from in the mantle, um, how it gets fed up vents, and the like. Uh, the next clip, clip three, is actually uh, from an event that it's the rift that is in the uh, Danakil Depression of the Afar Triangle in uh, in Ethiopia. And while we were working on the show, uh, this was a bit of serendipity for us because this event occurred um, back in 2005. They had trimmers that began in the Afar Triangle and they started and they lasted for several months. Um, and what we're seeing here, what the scientists are seeing here, and this is another thing that is was really fortunate for us for the for the show, is 
this action is the beginning of the birth of a new ocean. And so this is really analogous to what happened on the eastern coast of the United States back way back at, in the Permian when Pangaea started to uh, to break up. And uh, Cindy Evinger and Tim Wright and uh, Geza Gen Kuzu of Ethiopia were all really helpful to us to, to understand how this worked and to help us visualize this. Uh, we actually had a crew that went out into the depression with them. Uh, to uh, you know, to film this, and the act, the uh, beginning of the beginning frames of this shot were actually uh, they've been doctored a little bit, uh, but that was actually of part of the rifts uh, system out there in uh, in the, in the depression. Um, the last clip is uh, another instance of how things transform, and it's of New York, it's of the Hudson, it's of the Hudson Basin in uh, Manhattan, and it kind of charts how it has changed over time. Um, and uh, both Clark Birchfield and Lee Royden at, uh, at MIT, but not to mention Chris Keen and the folks at you know at the Times Geo Times Magazine were really helpful in helping us understand and be able to illustrate how this works. Um, and this is, uh, you know, computer animation is a really great way to convey how Earth works and how the processes are. Now, I understand this is not something that uh, is easily available to folks that want to, are interested in following a career <laughs> in this. However, it doesn't hurt to, you know, learn Possibly some, you know, Maya, uh, which is an anim which is the animation program that pretty much everybody uses, either Maya or Softimage or 3D Studio Max. They all do the the same kind of things. But one of what I've what I've learned in the time that I've spent around geologists is so many of them rely on art and mapping skills and the like and making PowerPoint presentations of things that it is not a very big step to move on into this area of animating. Um, I think that that is something that, uh, you know, is could be something that is accessible to, you know, pretty much anybody today. These programs are not even expensive as they were in the, in the past, as Doug mentioned. You can now edit on a laptop. You can animate on a laptop. Um, but the biggest thing about where you follow if you want to go down this road is to do of being in the media. And for me, in the visual media with uh, television programs and all, is to be able to learn to tell stories and to tell stories in a in a compelling in a compelling way. Uh, that's the whole name of the game. There are many places that you could actually intern. There are production companies that uh, specialize in doing natural science programming uh, that may give you an entree into uh, this world. And I don't know that it's so much that you have to have uh, clips or as much uh, when you're starting out as much as a passion to f follow this follow this path to have a passion for this type of thing of, of I really want to tell these stories I because the the story of our earth is going to be something that is going to is intrinsically interesting to everybody that lives here because we're all we're all inhabitants of, of uh, the planet and we're on along for the ride so geology is never going to go out of fashion, and you know as much as historical trends and all uh, may, you know, we may be interested in different types of history or different things in pop culture, but stories about the planet are always going to interest folks. So I think I'll turn it back over to the organizers, and if you guys have any questions, email me, and I'll try to answer. Them. Okay. Thank you very much, John. 
know, we have a question right here that pertains to your talk, which is, what are the names of the 3D animation programs that are available for home computers? Could you re, re say oh. those names? Okay, there's, there is Maya, which is uh, a, fairly, a, a fairly deep one. There's 3D Studio Max, mm -hmm. and there is Softimage, and I will in, I'll mention one more. There's Lightwave. Um, and if you're starting out, probably uh, either Lightwave or, or 3D Studio would be, the, would be the, the best ones to start with. Great, thank you. So I'd like to turn it over to all of the panels now, and I'd invite you to type your questions into the question box. Um, we'll have all the panelists answer some of the questions. Um, and I'll post them here on the um, the slide as we're as we're going through. So first, um, the first question we have is: What courses at university might have prepared you better to explain geoscience to the public? These could be existing ones you didn't take, or new ones that we need to develop. Um, this is Carolyn Gramley. I can I can sort of start by answering, giving my answer to that. Um, so. I actually um, originally came from a um, liberal arts background, <laughs> so certainly having a lot of writing courses um, in my undergraduate degree helped a lot. There's also, I think there's an increasing trend now, and this is something that I know is going on at my um, institution, uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Um, they're actually offering a course for graduate students um, to work with journalists. I'm one of the people who's going to be working um, with the students um, as a mentor, kind of to help them learn how to explain their science to a mass audience to a popular audience. So that is something that I know would be of, of great interest to a lot of people. I think that um, that's sort of a pilot program that they're doing at, at Hui, and um, apparently there's, there's a lot of interest from the students. Um, I think it's, it's certainly something that other grad schools would be advi well advised to take into consideration. Doug or John, do you want to add anything? Yeah, yeah I'd say uh, this is Doug. Um, I think like an intro, uh, kind of a, a history of geology would be uh, an interesting um, class to take uh, as far as kind of a general approach to how to explain geology to the public. I, I think any kind of class that looks at the bigger picture uh, and sort of works downwards as opposed to kind of starting at a, at, a, at a technical level and going outwards because that's kind of the way you that's the way you approach uh, television shows at least anyway is, is to kind of look at the bigger picture and, and try to find the things that that you can make a connection with people that don't have a background in geology because you know, most people don't um, I guess I was one, one of my points that I missed making was that five uh, I think is it um, Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there's only about 5% in the United States, 5% of the high schools uh, teach an earth science class, and that might only, at the most, might be for one class. Um, so, and then that could also be mixed in as often also mixed in with other sciences. So, um, and given that geology departments in colleges aren't that, that huge either, most adults, and I think it's, it's like that in other countries, but most adults don't have any formal training in earth sciences. And in, in our survey that we did, it turned out that um, most people get their information about science, their knowledge about science from television news. That's the number one source that people listed. And the number two source was the newspaper. So um, that, you know, that's fine, but, um, you know, as a as scientist, uh, as a scientist, you, you know that there's a lot being missed and a lot that isn't that, that you know that isn't covered in the science realm in the newspaper or on TV news. So um, it kind of leaves it to um, TV like documentary producers, um, PBS, Discovery Channel, and like Earth Magazine, um, you know, to, to places that uh, uh, cover types of media that cover uh, science in a little more in depth. Uh, than the TV news or um, newspapers to educate people on earth sciences uh, a little more than just on the surface. So 
um, I, you know, I take that very seriously, and I think there's like a huge amount of room for people to uh, to come and you know participate and and try to tell these stories that need to be told because people really aren't getting too much for science. So um, yeah, I kind of got off the subject a little bit, but uh, yeah. Uh, well, this is this is John. Um, I would say if you're interested in this in, in on a while you're still in college, I would one take a public speaking class. Uh, one of the reasons that on the news and in newspaper that science is always portrayed in just blips if it passes by is because of a, the spokesperson's inability to frame their answer in a concise way that gets the information out in an understandable way. And it's just, this is, we live today in a, in a world of sound bites. Uh, and even when you're making a TV show, uh, a documentary or whatever, you're having to take an interview with somebody and you're having to reduce it down to these salient bites. And so it's really important to be able to frame um, your discussion points in a in, a, in an articulate, understandable manner, that way it'll get, it'll get out there and it'll get played. It will also be interesting. One of the sad um, realities of television these days is there are less kind of special documentaries being done. All of the natural science outlets, such as the Discovery Channel, even the History Channel, uh, and National Geographic uh, to, to uh, to name just three of them, are all looking more for series rather than specials. Specials are hard to program into their programming slot. And so thinking about, if you're thinking about programming or you want to get involved with, with, with developing a program, uh, think about how to, how to come up with something that is, can be multi-part in terms of telling a story, a science story. Uh, it wouldn't hurt also to take um, an intro to filmmaking class, which will kind of give you some some basics about visualizing things. And you put a public speaking class, an intro to filmmaking class, and then, as Doug just mentioned, an intro to geology that is is something that's a great overview. That works. The teachers that I, the, or the, the some of the scientists that I found most effective in communicating their ideas are the folks that have lectured almost on a daily basis and teach the undergraduate classes because they've had to be able to convey this information to the football players and the baseball players and the basketball players as well as everybody else who is in there because their general education requirement for a Bachelor of Arts is three to six units of physical science. And these these instructors have gotten really, really good over the years at that, and and it's it. You can start yourself on that way by by doing by taking some classes in college. So the next question I'd like to pose. It's been observed that mass media is declining as the internet rises. How are you prepared, preparing to adapt to this transition? What about blogging, web video, and other sorts of self-produced media? Um, well, as a, as a representative of the mass media here, <laughs> um, I guess I can try and give my answer to that one, too. Uh, you know, there's no, there is no easy answer to that question, and this is obviously every outlet is wrestling with it. Um, so one thing that we've actually been discussing this quite a lot lately as well, uh, one thing that we have found is that you know, no one really has figured out how to make online stories pay, which is why organizations like the Wall Street Journal are already behind a paywall, and the New York Times is about to go behind a paywall. <clears throat> um, and so it's not necessarily the answer to um, put everything online and figure out how to, how to get advertising to pay for that. Um, However, at the same time, one thing that people have found to be true um, is that um, niche publications, such as we, Earth Magazine might consider itself a niche in that we have a very specific kind of focus um, on Earth science, um, those actually have an audience, and that audience is persisting. Um, our subscribers are persisting. So 
even though um, I think newspapers are in a great deal more trouble, um, we, we don't necessarily face quite the same challenges, although we certainly have our own challenges as well. Um, but to, to sort of get into the whole uh, you know, new media kind of idea, it certainly is true that um, blogging and other kinds of self-produced media are certainly competitors. And I think, the, the, like I said, there's no easy answer, but a lot of organizations do have to figure out how to diversify the way that they deliver content to their consumers. Um, and so you know, you're not just delivering it through your website anymore, even you're delivering it through um, maybe an iPhone app or other kinds of media like that. Um, as far as this is sort of part of a, another question about storytelling through, or you know, improving your craft of storytelling through blogging or you know, self-produced media in addition to doing other kinds of internships or that kind of thing. And I think that is certainly true. It's a great way to um, be able to um, just hone your craft and be able to figure out you know, how do you find the, the essence of the story? How do you find um, the thing that people most need to, to understand about what you're trying to tell them? Yeah, so this is Doug. Um, yeah, that's actually a great question because um, there is concern on in the television world about the declining viewership and the rise of the internet and everything. So actually, um, in order to really to get funded for a big series these days, you pretty much have to uh, you have to commit to doing a big website that's a companion to the uh, film. And so for a filmmaker, that's sort of like a whole new realm and skill that you really need to have. And, but I, th I think, you know, it's, it's actually that the Internet has gotten pretty easy to use, so it's, it's not such a, a bad thing. But, and in a lot of ways, it's, pretty, it's great because um, now you can stream whole entire films on, on the Internet and, and thereby get access to your uh, what you're trying your what you're trying to do your educational piece or whatever your film to anybody uh, so that they don't just have to go to the TV and, and watch it and also you can put on you know you, you can make your animations uh, be longer or more in depth and put in more interviews so you have this opportunity to kind of build this bigger uh, thing around the film that you made which I really like because when you get done making a film you've got like a room full of boxes full of information and well it used to be tapes now it's hard drives <laughs> but you've got all this stuff that you made a one hour film and you're all most people aren't are ever gonna see all this amazing stuff you just learned over the last five years or two years so um, the internet gives you a chance to put it out there uh, in in another way so I, I think it's great actually it's just it's just more work, but it's fun, and um, it's getting better all the time with the internet. So, and there's also the apps and coming along. Like we've got a project now in, in Hawaii that we're doing the volcanoes of Hawaii. So we're making a podcast that um, of the geologic sites around Hawaii that you can go to the internet and download this and put it on your iPod. And so when tourists are out going to all the different sites, whether they're geologic or cultural in Hawaii, they have this podcast on their, on their, you know, their iPod or, or whatever, um, and they can learn some geology while they're at it. So, so I, it, it's kind of, it has, it's, to me, it's opened up another sort of avenue for getting more information out. Well, this is, this is John, and yes, we are doing, you know, things on the web, uh, However, the Internet is both a, a blessing and a curse because it is largely unstructured. So you have all of this content that uh, you can put out there besides even a, a website. The trick is how do you drive people to it? Um, you know, YouTube has millions of clips on there. How do they – How what? what can you do to – get people to go to your clip on YouTube or to for a, be driven to your website. Now, if you've got the way to uh, – the fortunate ability to link to that because you've done a program that's on television and mm -hmm. the web address is at the, at the back of that or you've got a, a companion video that has come out that also can have web information on it, that's one thing. But in terms of you know self-publishing – 
and self-producing the media uh, and putting it out there, the real trick is, you know, how do you get eyeballs on your on your site to see that content? Um, and I think we're still all everybody's still all struggling with with what is the best way to go about that. We really have not seen uh, the merge of the computer screen with our uh, with our television screen. And just to kind of jump on about you know there's a question here about hearing about story. Um, yes, you do have to have a story, and a story is something that has a beginning, middle, and end, and and hopefully it has a little bit of dramatic structure to it. But the most effective ones, you're absolutely right in the question, that the most effective pieces of science uh, documentaries and all that I've been involved with, they work because they do have some entertainment. People learn when it's when it is couched in being an entertaining something that they are involved with, they grab that information a lot clearer than something that is just put forward almost as, you know, in kind of a textbook style. So having an entertainment aspect and having it be entertaining, engaging, and, you know, and fun, have it be lively is very important. And that's not that. That holds true whether it's in the written word as well as the visual medium. So. Yeah, and, I, and on that, uh, this is Doug, on the... Um, and that also holds to just for people who actually are just doing science that, that give talks or teachers. Um, they, if you, um, entertainment's kind of a, a hard word to, um, to actually pinpoint what that really means, but um, that could take so many different forms over just pure out and out passion or, or excitement over the subject you're conveying by like in a TV show the narrator for instance or the on-camera host or your interview subjects uh, to uh, just a structure of your story that holds people's attention and there's there's a lots of way to do that and you don't have to go overboard uh, into you know kind of um, sort of silliness or something you can there's lots of creative ways to grab people's attention and and um, you know we kind of uh, coming from a science background I it took me a while to sort of you know uh, at first I wanted to you know maintain this some some kind of um, science integrity to the the delivery of the information or something but uh, in the end um, if people if you don't get people's attention, and they they're not going to learn anything. So, um, and with television, they have the ability to just turn channels. So you you do have to sort of learn what people connect with when they're watching TV and that medium. And you can't just be totally outside of the out of the out of the realm of what's going on with the way people are, you know, watching TV, or else they're just going to turn a channel, which is not to say it's fun to experiment and, and push the envelope, but, you know, on, on the other hand, you're spending, you know, millions of dollars to make a, t a TV series or something, it's, you, you, you know, it's kind of, you can't take too many risks, uh, but it is fun to take as many as you can. <laughs> well, so. you know, I'll, I'd like to just give you guys a quick example, and this isn't out of science, it's, it's something more historical, but you can say, well, Lee lost the Battle of Gettysburg because his supply lines were stretched very severely. He had, they started the Battle of Gettysburg at a place where he did not intend to engage the Union Army. Or you can say the same kind of information. Lee may have lost the Battle of Gettysburg because, one, he was recovering from a heart attack, and he was stricken for three days during the battle with terrible diarrhea. And it's like, well, what's more interesting? It's like, whoa, wait a minute, this guy was sick? What did that have to do? We don't think in terms of looking at that information or that story in a slightly different way than people are, than the conventional way of just kind of like looking at the facts. You look at the facts, turn them inside out, and try to find that little thing that is like, gee whiz, that's going to make everybody sit up and pay attention. I just, this is Carolyn, um, I just wanted to sort of add on that. I think, um, I can't remember if it was uh, Doug or John who mentioned before that, you know, this is what you do in science, too. And that was certainly true in my experience as a grad student. I presented at a number of conferences, and 
I was always told, you know, find the three things that you want to say and just say those, and that's the story you're trying to tell. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, the, the, as the aspect of storytelling really isn't just limited to, um, you know, the media really is, you know, sort of, there's always going to be a story in, in the science, and that is the thing that people con connect to on a human level, and that's really the way to get people to care. Great. Um, we have a number of questions about internship opportunities. Um, if you have any specific suggestions for internships, how can they find an internship? And one about, uh, are there any recommendations for postgraduate school internship type programs? Um, let me just answer that real quick since I had talked a little about internships. Uh, this is Carolyn again. In my, um, in, the, in the web um, presentation that you can download from this, um, I've actually updated the internship page that I had. So there's actually now a link on there to a list of um, internships for science writing that um, people might be interested in. So you can go back to that page and look at that. I should also mention that Earth Magazine does have an, a science writing internship as well. Um, so there's a link to that on that page also. I don't know specifically about post-grad school internship programs. I know some of them are specifically for students, but I don't think they all are. So you sh it's definitely worth looking through the list and seeing which ones might, might work for you. Well, I think uh, another thing is uh, uh, if you're in college, avail yourself to your college career center because they will have uh, a list of internships that are possible or potential. Uh, each depart, each school, and, and I'm an alumni of, Chap of Chapman University back then it was Chapman College, but I've done 35 internships over the, over the years, and some of those come to me through the, through the departments, which would be either communications or from the film and television department or from the career center. So that's, a, that's actually a good place to, to, to check. And if you're looking for an internship that may be out of your, sort of like your course focus, you know, go and check over, at the, over in, the, in the communications department and look on the boards because uh, a lot of times those things are posted on the departmental bulletin boards and that's a, that's a definite way to, you know, to start. Hmm. Now, unfortunately, I've got to sign off because I, I have to be somewhere here in, in like about like five minutes. So uh, oh, okay. I'm talking to you guys and send me any yeah. questions, send them to me and I'll try to answer them back so you can post them on the web. We will. Any extra questions that we don't have time for, we will make sure that are, are sent out to the speakers, and we'll post them on the website, the answers. John, thank you so much for participating. It's my pleasure. Bye-bye. At this time, we'll take, I want to take one more question, um, and we'll talk about, maybe Doug can um, share some information about getting his projects funded. What are some of the best fundraising resources you could share? Wow. Um, gosh. Let's see. That's, uh, that's, it's funny because every project I think I've done is, is different. Um, there's one for uh, one that's that we've kind of been tapped into for years is National Science Foundation um, has a pretty. It's very very competitive. It's pretty tough to do it, but if you're you're willing to hang in there for for a long time and just uh, get a lot of rejections uh, at first, um, you can eventually hopefully figure out how things um, get funded over there. Um, it's a big source for science television documentaries, uh, so that's worth checking into. Uh, but, but at first, um, I think um, it's more, uh, well, I was at the U.S. Geological Survey when I started making films, so I sort of, my first films I got funded internally at the survey by begging around different branches for for funding for films or people came to me for funding or something so that that was uh, fortunate I think though if you don't if you're not like at a ready government source or something like that um, you can uh, I think uh, what, uh, what I would do is I would uh, find some scientists who are uh, this kind of is also in the internship realm. Um, find some scientists going on a really, uh, uh, they have a big project, like look look at the NSF or wherever country you are, Just find out who's got a big uh, project that's going to an interesting place. Um, just volunteer to, to go as an intern, um, as, as the geologist one, but also bring a camera and um, 
and document things. And chances are you can probably get your travel expenses paid. And um, so, but go as a as a documentarian. And I know that scientists are, are nowadays, especially, really looking for for that. And um, they really um, because there there just aren't enough film producers to go around that can go out with people on trips and there's some incredible science being done on some amazing uh, projects that it's just a shame they, they go undocumented so um, try to get on one of a, a project like that and um, as a volunteer but you know get your expenses paid but take your camera uh, shoot some footage and um, just edit a you know a small thing that you can um, make a make a small clip of it or something but also um, uh, get in touch with somebody like Nova and offer the footage to uh, television or, or someone like me you can uh, our organization is always looking for footage like that Earth Image Earth Images Foundation earthimage.org <laughs> and interns too by the way if you, I'd be happy to uh, talk to you about being an intern, uh, if if you're interested, and just Doug at EarthImage.org is my email. Um, but funding is something; it's weird. It's it's there's no set um, like official way to do it for for science films until you're very established. So at first, it's more a matter of um, finding the the topic you want to do something with somehow getting yourself out there to shoot some footage and and it's just amazing how s the funding will opportunities will come to you it's it, you it's um there are you know maybe the scientists have a little extra money to give you to edit your film um or you know somebody uh at nova or somebody might hear about what you're doing and give you some money to put something together it it it's just uh things you know, as long as you're very persistent about it, they seem to happen, and that's uh, that's sort of the way it's been with me. And I've always, you know, would typically start out at a project and go, "How are we ever going to get this funded?" And things just the strangest things will happen with where money comes from. So um, you just have to be persistent. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thanks, everyone. That's all the time we have for questions today. If you have any questions that were not addressed, you can email them to us. We'll be posting today's recorded webinar on our GEO webinar site soon. So visit the website to view this webinar as well as previous ones and check out the webinar schedule for upcoming webinars. Thank you very much for participating in today's webinar. This concludes our program for today.